Hi, uh, I'm Jason Warner. I am the SVP of Engineering and CTO at GitHub, and I am relatively new there. I just passed my 90 day mark, which is fun because I wrote, like to write, and I like to write internally, so I did a 90 day review. And I actually linked to this presentation, which I was very happy to do. It's fun to do that. Um, before GitHub, I was the VP of Engineering at Heroku inside Salesforce. And if everyone knows what Heroku is, platform as a service, and it's kind of the underpinnings of Salesforce public cloud strategy at this point. So I have a lot of fun, mostly infrastructure backgrounds, but primarily what I am is an engineering leader who understands how to scale organizations and kind of that's that's my little thing. I'm not a great developer anymore, don't really do that. But I like to I like to think about organizations as engineering units. Um, and I think the first thing we should talk about is what we mean by scale here. And given this is an engineering talk, we definitely don't mean technology. This is not about any technical underpinnings. This is not about cloud. This is not about running all the software. This is not what this is about. This is about the, the organization, the human side of all of this, putting all the right things in place to actually take your organization from the tens, the fifties, the hundreds, and whatnot. And I think Steve's point about each one of those phases being a discrete difference is something that we all will eventually go and see and feel once we have that chance to be inside an organization as it grows. And um, if you have been through a high growth organization, you're going to understand what this means. If you haven't, it's a, quite a ride. But um, what I like to say here is that when we're talking about scale, there's quite a few things that become interesting in this. So for me, what it is, is also, it's understanding where companies are, where organizations are, all in the stage. So, um, I like to use myself as an example here. I am not the right engineering leader for a four, five, ten person organization. I know that about myself. I know what I do well, I know what I don't do well, I know what I like to do and what I don't like to do. And I know where my sweet spot is in the world, and I'm pretty happy to, to play inside those lines. Um, I think the difference is when I'm talking about scales, understanding that what's necessary at one stage will definitely not be appropriate for the next stage of an organization. And to understand that it's fine to do something over here one day and to change it next. We have to be okay with that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So there's a couple of principles I like to talk about when we're talking about scaling organizations. And lots of techniques will work and lots of things will happen. These are just things that I have seen over the 25 years of doing this. And there's always some uh, oddity about standing up here and talking about this because I know how many times I screwed up all these things. So it feels kind of weird to say, hey, let's uh, talk about, you know, let's be a thought leader in the engineering space. And it just feels kind of odd because really at the end of the day, all I'm really doing is making some mistakes really fast and learning from them to not do them again the next day. So let's, um, let's try to short circuit some of your mistakes. So, um, a good friend of mine sat me down one day and was talking about something and said, you know, I like to view the world, I like to view the world in a couple different ways. And I like to say that there's poets in the world, there's librarians in the world. And you never want a poet doing a librarian's job, you never want a librarian doing a poet's job. <laughs> now obviously for us in the room, we don't like to categorize that way, we think that there's spectrums of these things. But my boss happened to be one of the kind of ultimate poets he was one of those that would always pontificate and talk about philosophy and things like this. And as an engineering leader, I'm actually much more poet than I am librarian. But when I compare myself to my old boss, I was definitely a librarian. And I think understanding this, understanding who people are and what they're good at too, is going to help us in this conversation here. So this today is then that spectrum of scale. I think Steve's point, I, I, I'm going to have to buy you a lot of beer and talk about how you grew from 2,000 to 5,000 or whatever that number was, or 220 to 5,000, because that had to be one of the more interesting phases to see. I've seen 5 to 500, I've seen 50 to 1,000, but that's pretty interesting. So this is what we're talking about on the spectrum of scale, knowing that those discrete phases exist and being okay and understanding what the differences between them, and um, also knowing that the, again, those principles that apply will kind of generally apply, but the practices might not. Things that were efficient in one stage might actually drag you down in another. And things that would, would never have flown at a, at a stage of 50 is exactly what's needed at a stage of 500. So today we're all going to be poets, and I want us to kind of 
not talk about tools, not talk about techniques, and not talk about all the different things that are all of our engineering lives. And it's kind of funny that I'm standing up here with a GitHub shirt saying, let's forget about tools. Uh, by the way, you should all forget about tools. Um, but we, this is not what this is about. We're not talking about tools, and we're not talking about languages, and we're not talking about frameworks. In fact, we're gonna end up talking about people. So, can't go too far talking about how to scale organizations without talking about culture. And I would offer one thing. Your culture will be whatever it is. You, as a leader in the organization, should care for your culture. But I would offer one point. I would hope at some point you don't actually talk about your culture, because that's not what you're after. You're not after a great culture in your organization, but you want a healthy culture. But when you focus too much on certain things, I find in my history that we start to make those the focal point of conversations. And then that becomes the optimization point. So this is what I want to say on the culture side. It will become what it is. You, as the leader in your organization, need to care for it. You need to think about it, and you need to push your organization to be that. Don't make that the focal point of your conversation, folks. And then the next caveat slide, which is the technology. Um, of all of the things I have found in doing this, is that technology will shape the way your organization is shaped and runs. And this is the one technology slide in here, is to understand that there's one principle I like to drive home here, is from a technology standpoint, push your organization to do things on your time horizon. Do things when you want to do them, not when some outside force makes you do it. Whether that's the scale of the technology, a market condition, whatever it be, when you are forced to change your technology, to adapt your technology, that's not the time that you want to actually do it. You want to be more thoughtful than that. So get in front of all of those things. And that's the last time I'm going to mention technology here. So what does it take to scale organizations? Well, this is what I call the base, the, all the principles that everything else is built upon for this, this conversation. So for me, when I'm talking about scaling organizations, I'm talking a lot about loosely coupled. I want, a, I want an organization that can be autonomous and accountable to itself and have the goals set out, and they understand those things. They understand the mission of the organization, and they, everyone can point to a, the, the North Star of the group and say, this is what we're going for. And if you can't answer that question, it's very difficult to actually make forward progress. You're gonna, you're gonna not all be pointing in the same direction, obviously. There's, there are points in times when people will actually be pointing 180 degrees away from each other. And that's obviously not what you're going for. So, you know, let's, you spend some time on this, it kind of feels okay to talk about missions and values, but I think it's actually an incredibly important tool to use, at least from an alignment perspective. Um, principles and practices are something that I use as coaching points and guides for, for either other engineering leaders or other leaders in organizations as well as managers to ICs. This to me is, what are the things that we do? What are the things we about? What are the things we're not about? And how are we going to put that into practice? Um, there's a quote at the end of, the, end of this, uh, which is basically the culture of any organization is defined by the worst behavior any leader tolerates. And to me, this is a lot of what this is. You want to put these in place so that people can have conversations before issues become large. So this is, again, do things on your own time horizon. Hit those small issues, people, process, whatever they are, before they, are, they become big issues, and, and talk about these things and why you're actually having this conversation. It's hard. You know, if you're an engineer and you say, hey, I value speed, to one Steve's point about that spectrum, and the other one's I value beauty, well, if you don't, if, if you don't have explicitness in the system, that's a conversation, that's a debate. But if you actually get explicit and say, here's what we're going to value, we're going to be faster than slow, and we're going to bias towards getting something to market a little faster. You've done defined that conversation, the parameters of that conversation, that allows you to at least set the framework for folks. Um, leadership is obviously um, one of the most important elements of this, and leadership can take many factors and forms. But for me, in this um, presentation, what we're actually talking about when I think of leadership is people you can point to in the organization who are examples of what you want others to look like and be like and act like and talk like and be. So this is, uh, in Steve's point, you can say, hey, if you want to make it a senior engineer, here are the things you need to do. Examples of that drive that home more than words on paper. And because no matter what's going to happen, 
you're going to see people who look to the senior people in the organization and however they are behaving is going to be how others view as acceptable behavior. And for me, I take this pretty seriously when I think about being a leader in any organization. And I say um, quite openly that I can only expect every organization or every person in the organization to be as good as me on my worst day. My floor is likely going to be the organization's ceiling because they will think that my worst day is the acceptable. acceptable. And if I take that seriously, that means that I have got to be incredibly good every day. Because me on my worst day is not a pleasant thing. I know that. My wife knows that. My kids know that. So I have to take that a little bit more seriously than others might. And I really have to be that person I want others to be. Um, and on this one is um, authenticity is something we talk about, but I don't think anyone really understands what that means. Um, I don't know either, to be frank. I can tell you what it means to me and what I have done. And basically, it's not bringing my whole self to work or anything like that. It's, it's talking like I would normally. I'm not trying to put on faces or, or masks, and I'm not doing things that I wouldn't normally do. I'm not having conversations I wouldn't normally have. I feel that any random person in the organization that talks to me is the same as I would be talking to Steve at a VC firm or my CEO. It's, I'm trying to treat everyone similarly. Everyone to me is a human, and that to me is opening myself up and having those conversations, but letting people know I care, and letting people know I'm generally interested in a certain set of things and talking about those. And the last thing about the, the base is the measurables. Um, there's a lot of talk about goals, there's a lot of talk about OKRs, there's a lot of talk about being two moms, or whatever the alignment tool is, but this is an incredibly important thing to put into an organization because you're never going to measure success or distance or progress if you don't understand what you're actually trying to achieve. So, um, candid truth, I'm really not a numbers person. I don't like that. But uh, it's something that we have to hold, we have to put into an organization. We have to actually push this towards. I'm a huge fan of alignment tools like the OKRs or V2Moms because, again, it's putting numbers to initiatives and it's putting things out on paper and then having those big conversation points. So those are the, the strong base. Now we're gonna talk about a couple of other things. These are, we'll go more quickly through these and um, have some fun in Q&A. But I'm gonna talk about some things I think you should add when you're scaling, things you should remove, things you should care about, and things you shouldn't care about. Um, again, your mileage may vary, experiences and contexts are very different in places, but this is stuff that I've, I have t gleaned over the years. So what I like to add if you're trying to scale organizations, the first one is experience managers. Um, there's a place for inexperienced managers and first-time managers, and I absolutely believe that place is inside those organizations. But if your entire frontline management tier are first-time managers, you're in trouble. That's a full stop, period. You're in trouble. And the reason why is that they're going to make all the same mistakes in a room, in a one-on-one, -on -one, or in an individual conversation that you are not privy to until it's gone full cycle, maybe two or three times, and then the problem gets large. So you need to have some mentors for those folks. You need to be able to have conversations with those folks. And you can't do that if you're trying to scale your organization. You can't be that to everybody. So you need to have a mix. You need to have some experienced managers and some first-time managers as well. But make sure you got some experience in there. Um, I very much believe in autonomy in organizations and accountability. This goes back to measurables, though, as well. You can't have autonomy without measurables and accountability. Otherwise, you have chaos. That's just that's what autonomy means without any accountability. And um, I believe that when, for me, when I'm trying to put principles in place or processes or things like this, I am driving more towards an autonomous, accountable culture. Highly initiated, initiated individuals is magic. If you can find several people in your organization where you can have a quick chat with and say, hey, I'm worried about a thing, and the next thing you know, they come back and said, I asked a whole bunch of questions, I found this out, I did a thing, whatever. Those people are gold, 100%. Goal. And if you're ever trying to impress your boss or whoever it be that you report to, find out what your boss cares about most or what wor that worries that person, and come back with some conversation points or some answers or, so, or even some more questions like, it, it, this is, you, you don't understand what kind of pain you're taking away from that person. And um, nothing is as frustrating as having several highly initiated individuals and one or two that aren't. Because what you see is, very large portions of the organization advance quickly, and then others don't advance at all, or there's no movement. 
And it's, it's rather alarming to see, if you have a scale that organization, how one person can make such a dramatic difference in a relatively short amount of time, both positively and negatively. Um, just enough process is my way of saying, uh, don't overdo it. You want just enough to bring some semblance of order, but you don't want to make this so heavy. And it's a balance, this is a stage thing again. What will work at five will not work at 5,000. So just enough at 5,000 looks very different than five. Um, ownership kind of goes to autonomy and accountability. You want people who are gonna own large chunks of area. You want people who are gonna make those decisions. You don't wanna to have to be making decisions. You do not wanna to have to be making those decisions. You wanna set up the context, you wanna allow people to thrive on their own. Uh, disagree and commit is uh, one of those things that I hammer home as much as possible, is that if you have an ownership model and you have accountability and autonomy, you're gonna be times in any organization where even senior leaders absolutely disagree with each other, but when they leave the room, when a decision is made, they have to be committed to it, because otherwise the success of that is not gonna be guaranteed. I mean, success is never guaranteed in the first place, but if you have one person who's ambivalent to the outcome and just gonna drag your feet on the thing, you're not gonna make progress no matter what. Relationship and positivity kind of go hand in hand to me. Relationship is investing in people. Spend time with them, learn about them as individuals. At the end of the day, there's a, there's a person at the other side of the table all the time. Find out about that person. This is not a trick, this is not a tactic. This is to human connections. And we're working with, with all these folks day in, day out. They've got wants, they've got needs, they have fears, they've got problems at home. This isn't culture, this isn't talk about this and be a dumping ground. This is just understand that there's there's, there's a person at the end of the line, treat them the way you would want to be treated, and understand, again, your worst day is going to be theirs. The organization's in their best day. Um, I'll go through this one pretty quickly, but these are all pretty obvious, I would hope. Um, politics will destroy organizations, get rid of it. Anyone who plays political games, one conversation, continue, no more, no more conversations. Um, Zero-sum games are one of those inside organizations that are tricky, they sneak in. This is, um, unfortunately in hierarchy when you have VPs and senior directors and directors, that's a kind of a natural zero-sum game in terms of title, but don't do it in compensation. Find ways to reward people and find ways to make sure that they feel valued, even if the title's not there or organizational hierarchy, and particularly with your engineers. Make sure that engineers and make sure that others in the organization are well compensated and they don't hit this kind of weird ceiling where they have to then jump to the manager track and uh, become something they don't want to be to feel valued and compensated. Take care of your folks. Uh, wrong pronouns. I, I watch this all the time. I don't like, I don't like the, the I's and me's, um, the you's, the, I like the us's and the we's. I think reinforce that. Um, this is uh, pretty, pretty easy if you practice. And once you do practice and you start using yourself, you start to see it all the time. And then once you see it, it kind of annoys you more because you've also worked on it yourself. Um, but you also realize how, how a simple thing like words are going to derail things. Uh, squeaky wheels is one of my, my, my pet peeves. This is someone who really is going to complain about the same thing over and over again, no matter what is going to be the case. In a disagree and commit way, a lot of times you're going to say, this is just the way this is. We're not going to make this change. And that person's going to continue. You've got the, these folks will do it publicly, they do it in emails, they do it in repos, they do it all over the place. It's not healthy. And um, this is something small, irritating, but it kind of drives home points. Um, this is another one that's supposed to ownership, did my job, not my job. Anyone who sees something falling off a table and just lets it fall because that's not their, their thing, that's a, that's a good coaching point you can have with that person. Um, to the disagree and commit, I've seen organizations that will be completely derailed by being consensus driven. Don't be consensus driven is my advice. Is there's a time and place when you should have alignment, is the way I would say it, but if you need everyone on the same page 100% of the time to do something, progress is going to slow at its best and stall at its worst. And then obviously negativity. This is not, um, this is not someone saying, I don't think this is gonna work. This is someone saying, this is all shit, you're all terrible, everything's broken. I believe in, in tech we have this tendency to have this nirvana fallacy that if it's not perfect, it's shit. And there's a, obviously this spectrum in between there that exists, but a person who's you know, highly, highly negative is always going to be on the shit side of the fence. Um, ironically, the person who's always on the positive side of the fence is sometimes just as uh, dangerous. 
um, everything's going to be rosy. You find those in salespeople a lot. They overproject. They over overcommit. Um, so some things I don't like to worry, I don't tend to worry about, which is the duplication of tooling. I think it's fine. I want people. Me personally, one of my one of the ways I want to build organizations is to go faster than slower. So I'm okay with tooling duplication for me and getting out faster. Um, culture fits is something I really don't like the word for. Um, there are people all across the world, people of all walks of life. Culture fits is just a way to, I think, box people in and say, I don't like that person. They're not a culture fit. There's, there's no real reasoning behind it. I don't, I don't understand it. As an engineer, I feel like, how can we as engineers ever say someone's not a culture fit and there's no data behind it? There's no, there's no actual thought or rigor. It's, it's the easiest escape hatch ever. 100% um, alignment, go back to the screen. Man, I don't think you need to, to worry about that. The perfect org structure is one that I, I work with um, younger engineering leaders on quite a bit. The, we have this tendency to try to fit everything perfectly inside whatever structure you're coming towards or whatnot. Um, I believe that all org structures are flexible over time, particularly. But in reality, as well, the, um, most org structures work very, very well for about 80 to 90 percent, and then the last 10 percent is just not going to fit whatever it be. Uh, and you, what you need to ask yourself, in my opinion, in that case is, what is the advantage to this? What's the negative? What's the weakness of this model? And are we okay with the weakness in this model? Can we live with this for now? And if you can answer yes, we can live with the weakness because we can do X, Y, or Z around it, go ahead. And then obviously giving everything right. Getting everything right is another one of those ways to kind of solve progress. Um, that's just to move faster than slower inside organizations. Um, do worry about, I made this mistake. Actually, this entire slide is my mistake slide. Um, too many programming languages and frameworks. This, um, there's a time and place for pro programming languages and frameworks, but if you have proliferation, you've, uh, you're gonna have natural silos. Uh, if you want that and you're explicit about it, okay, sure, but if you don't, watch for this and guard against it. Um, I'm actually a believer in a couple of things. I believe that most organizations really need, at this point, JavaScript framework, whatever is JavaScript, um, a dynamic language, a compiled language, and some sort of um, uh, message transfer, data transfer mechanism inside, whether that be you're going to use APIs, you're going to use buses, whatever that be, and then behind it obviously is the database. But if you kind of broadly say this is what our needs are, it's a pretty discrete set of tools that you can actually um, pick. Um, obviously with now with ML, there's a little bit more sophistication inside that. Uh, yeah, do worry about the toxic negative attitudes, all the political agendas. Internal competition as a survival mechanism. This is one of my favorites in very large dysfunctional organizations. A classic Apple or Microsoft from the 90s strategy of uh, you two organizations go build me the thing. The one I like the best get their jobs. The one that doesn't, I don't like, uh, yeah, we'll find you later on the outside, not working here anymore. That, there's no better way to create a toxic environment than to have people compete for jobs in a Lord of the Flies gladiator style competition between each other. It'll just happen naturally. You don't have to do much work. If that's your goal, if you're an internal saboteur, do this. Um, I think uh, do worry about being too slow. I think organizations that move faster tend to pay, organizations that tend to move faster tend to be more obviously more productive, but also higher morale. You find that people are focusing more on the engineering problems or the, the market problems. Goes too slow, it allows more of the navel gazing, allows more of the talk about culture, allows more of the talk about we're not doing this well, or even competition to creep in. Uh, and then employee churn, morale, output, market reputation to me are signals about how healthy or not you're being viewed in the market. Uh, and I am wearing a GitHub shirt. So we can talk about that later. <laughs> Finish it with writing everything down. Um, this is just a healthy habit. I think in 2017, many organizations are highly distributed. This is just a good habit to get into once you've made some decisions or uh, you've kind of gone in a direction, write it down. I believe in iterations, constant, constant iterations as in the org as well as technology. I believe healthy organizations find tighter feedback loops in tech and in orgs. Um, I also believe in iterating up and to the right, which basically means that every time you're making a change, you're making an incremental change that is advancing your organization explicitly to your principles, practices, outputs, whatever they be. Um, and this is something that you should ask yourself, is this change Everyone wants to say every change is a positive change, but you should say, is this a change explicitly to support whatever our goal is? And that's a different question and answer. Um, invest in your people. 
send them to management training, bring coaches in. Um, at Rogue, we had an agile coach on staff. Um, it was one of the better things that we did. We didn't, we didn't have any one agile process, but it was more talking about why things can go fast and go slow and things you have to watch for. I think it's a valuable investment. Uh, and then this last one is the reward and examples of the culture. This is, you don't, because if someone is a fabulous engineer, but a terrible human, and you promote that person, you've effectively validated that the engineering is more important than the human side. If you're okay with that, that's fine. But if you don't understand what you're actually saying there, is you're telling others how to behave and act. And on the flip side, if a person is a wonderful human being and never produces anything, and you promote that person for being a wonderful human being, what are you saying? So understand what you want your culture to look like, and find those folks, test them, and advance them. So the takeaways. What I like to talk about here, these are mostly my two favorite quotes of all time. So this one is, uh, uses, I use this a lot in uh, cheeky ways, but um, most organizations find themselves talking about people a lot. Most organizations want to talk about ideas. And if you think about what that really means is you've got to push your organization to get out of the people business and into the idea business. Once you're in the idea business, the world's your oyster. If you're in the people business, you're internally focused, you're looking at each other. Everyone starts to become an enemy or a friend or uh, what was that show or the survivor you had to make alliances or whatever the thing is, I don't know. But if you get to ideas, Nobody's against each other, you're all, you're all for ideas. Get to that point. And then this goes to, again, um, what you as a leader in the organization are willing to tolerate. Uh, what goes across your public mailing lists? What goes in Slack channels that you're okay with? Um, all that sort of stuff. These, it's, it sounds like a lot of work, because it's a lot of work, but this is where you have to scale your organization with people as well. Um, so these slides are, mostly appendix slides, but the, uh, this one is the one I like to, to point out here, is that engineering leadership, while we're all engineers, is actually not engineering as much as it is about humans. And there's, a, there's this black art that happens there. There's a human connection, there's a feel, there's kind of gut instinct, there's watching and learning, and there's a lot of kind of on the flyness that happens when it comes to people. The organization building is a lot like engineering, but the people side, is a lot like art. And understanding that you're never going to engineer your way out of a people problem, that's a good place to, to have some understanding. You can, organize it, you can organize your way out of delivery problems. You can organize your way out of um, process problems, but people problems is where the art comes in. Um, this is another one I would like to point out. Avoid the hype. Avoid thought leadership. Standing up here talking about this. Um, but my, my, my favorite example of this is um, 37 Signals and David Heinemeier Hansen, the, the people who make Rails and whatnot, they are some of the loudest voices in software and they are very, very opinionated. And they're right for a very narrow segment of software. But they don't say that. They don't say that this is, this is a narrow band of software that we, we fit in and our decisions are discrete to us for our context. They talk, they're talking wide and loud and saying, you all should, not we, have decided. Uh, avoid the hype, understand your context, and dive deep on that. Understand that thought leadership, whatever it be, is just for the context that person or that organization was in itself. You have to find your own. Um, always be improving, uh, and this is another one I like. Uh, yeah, you should like who you work with, but you're going to have to put up with some people too, and that's not a bad thing. You don't have to love everybody, but you got to find a way to work with people. And if you have conflict, find ways to have the healthy conflict and tension. And if there's someone that's you're having trouble with, or people in your org have trouble with, build frameworks and language around helping them understand how to engage with that. One of the one of the best ways you can help people is to show them how to disagree with others in a healthy way, and get to, to resolution in, in advance. That's, and that's hard. It's easy when we're all aligned, we all, we all agree on a topic. It's hard when we disagree slightly. And the other point on this one I like to point out too is that 90% of the time, people agree on most things, but they will fight vigorously for the last 5%, and they will focus on that last 5%, but the Venn diagram overlap of where they actually agree is so large. 
get them to get people to realize how much actual agreement they have, and actually you know they're best friends. Um, if they focus on the negatives where they disagree, might as well be two warring tribes of Red Sox or Yankees fans or something like that. Uh, and this one is just because it's shocking. I need, to, I need to put a transformer in my slides. So um, yeah, that's just some of the things that I've learned over the last couple of years doing this. Um, happy to answer questions at this point or talk about some of the other things that might be fun to talk about. someone's future potential and productivity in whatever time box way that you're having kind of hokey interactions. So uh, one of the things that we like to do is actually very similar to what Steve talked about. So you try to get them into a working session and at least see what they, they can do, what their conversation is like. Um, but you're never going to be able to tell about someone's motivation, typically. Um, there's signal, but there's no slam dunk way to do that. Um, however, there's some, there's, there's some ways to maybe tease that out which is you know enthusiasm and things like this. But at the end of the day, somebody somewhere could show all the right signal, and it could be a mistake to hire that person. Um, so this is where we also have to be good at ha having those tough conversations about this is not what we are about at that place. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned on the same slide the zero sum games and um, how to advance people, engineers who are at the top of their maybe pay scale or their title. And find creative ways. Can you give us an example of how you have approached this in the past? So a couple of things that we've done is obviously increased our pay bands to compensate folks. Um, we've allowed people to do um, go deep projects, which is something that they may very, very much believe in, but it might not fit into the box that we're in at the moment. But if you've done certain things for the organization, you've earned a right to have certain bets placed on you as an individual. We want those go deep projects are, we're not sure about this, you, you seem to be pretty impassioned about it, come back in three months, tell us what you can do. That's a good way to engage folks. Um, the other one is finding other things that, that are gonna stretch them in ways that are meaningful to them, and that's very, very individual to the person. But luckily, once you have, um, if you're a successful organization, you have people at like, well, I, I would call the distinguished engineer stage, it's probably in the tens um, of people, so you can have individual conversations and know who they are and let them go. And I've also done in the past, I've given them um, decent lumps of money, not in terms of compensation, but go go find a thing, go what, what's the next thing? You seem to be pretty interested in this. Here's actually some money, go acquire something, go build a thing, go do a thing, whatever you want to do. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the terms of the size of organizations, something I call uh, someone's great effectiveness. How did you balance that? Do the same thing that you already do again versus trying something that maybe someday you'll be good at? Um, so the question was, how do I balance, uh, the, I know what I'm good at, I know what stage I'm at, how do I balance maybe stretching myself a little bit versus kind of doing uh, what I'm good at? Uh, well, so my end goal is not to be the CTO of GitHub. Um, I mean, I, I want to at one point run a company. Um, I want to do that. For the stage of my life right now, I can't start something um, for family reasons, but I wouldn't mind being dropped in at a B-series CEO at some point. So I, I have something out there that's different than what I am, and I'm constantly trying to work at that aspect of things with people I trust or people uh, I respect. I'm also watching and trying to push myself inside the organization in that way. Um, but. The, in, the, in the classic don't don't forget what got you there type of scenario, I know why I am where I am, and it's not because I am a very good EVP at an apple-sized organization, and I know, I know what I'm good at. So I want to know what I'm good at, but get me to a different goal as well. Yeah. Uh, on the not, you mentioned zero-sum games, right? Or zero-sum games. 
Uh, on the other hand, you have ad people who are like highly motivated and uh, high output people. So they tend to be like hungry folks. How do you avoid zero sum game when you have like multiple hungry folks in your team? Typically, what I find when people have the zero sum game approach is that for someone else to advance, someone else has to to lose. So this is a win lose scenario, and that is what you want to avoid. I like to say that um, what someone does is as important as how they do it, and the telltale sign for that is that that cynic in the back of the room claps when that person gets acknowledged. That usually is one of those, those ways for me to, to, to understand that that person is a highly effective person and someone that others look to as, as well. So um, zero-sum games tend to be uh, monetary or organizational power, things like this, and the organizational uh, dynamic one is the hardest one because we are structured as hierarchies, but I find that you can also get away from that by making other roles or making other divisions or increasing. And, and if people are actually doing their jobs and we're all being effective, most likely the company itself is actually growing and so more area, service area is there. So if you're in a static growth company, unfortunately you're probably going to find that you're, you're stuck. But if you're in a high growth company or you're in a, a growth stage company, new opportunity will be created. If you think about whatever I was before, Salesforce, they've constantly been growing at about a 45 to 50% clip year over year. Next thing you know, an entire ecosystem team is up. Next thing you know, there's a venture capital growth uh, arm up. People, tend, people will then tend to run those things as well. Well, you, you keep them internal, but you lose them in their function. You see how they're going to stretch themselves. And some of those people, yeah, you're going to lose, and they're going to go to other places. Um, the worst thing that could ever happen I think is that if you have a number two or number three person in whatever organization you are in, and next thing you know, they are, they're plucked away because they're number two or number three person in your organization, but they feel that the only way to, for them to advance is to move. Um, and that's never, you're never going to fully push that out, but if you lose two, three, four, and five, you're in trouble. So you've got to try to push as much of that zero sum game out as possible. So uh, GitHub is a staple of the tech industry, uh, so I'll start with that compliment. But you also mentioned your GitHub shirt and culture, uh, and you joined at an interesting time. Love to hear kind of your thoughts on uh, leading through kind of turbulent changes or potentially like external views on the company that you may or may not agree with. Just love to hear more about that. Um, how long do you have? <laughs> this is... Uh, a good topic. So I've been in three months, but I have been talking to GitHub for quite some time about it. And the my blunt assessment of GitHub was that it was it's remarkable what it has achieved for so long in a no manager mode. And it basically was an anarchist dream. You look at this place, there's it's, it's chaos inside of it and it advanced and all that sort of things. But I have this premise that no manager is actually a very good thing for organizations up to a certain size, and most organizations will naturally move to a more manager model at some point, you know, somewhere around 50, 25, 50, they'll have more tiers and whatnot. GitHub put that to an extreme, and it had no managers until it hit 500 people. It also had $200 million of revenue, it had the entire contemporary software development life cycle on it. So with no natural predators, you can get away with a lot. And I think money and success paper over since. But GitHub's place and prominence in the world at the moment is also not as high as it could be, in my opinion, and will be. And changes and slight, slight tweaks and all that sort of stuff is going to manifest itself differently. And how I, I view that is uh, don't make that same mistake. Don't do what GitHub did classically in its past. Don't be that type of place that says, we're a developer, we know our audience, we're just going to do the thing. Don't be the type of place that says, we're a developer, we're going to make our own HR process because we know better how to do that. Find the experts in all those fields and let them go do their thing. You be the expert at your domain and trust the other people to be experts in theirs. <laughs> What's the score? Yes. Yeah. You, you talked about remo removing politics. Can you please elaborate a little more? How, how do you do that? It's really like uh, This is the hardest one I feel to do because. What is? Oh, um, politics. How do you remove politics? 
if you know, talk about removing, how do you do it? This one is two words on a slide that is 90% of your emotional energy in an organization. And once politics are in, it's hard to unroot. And however, there is some solace in this. Usually politics do manifest mostly in people. And there's usually a couple of people that you can go have conversations with to hit the root of most of the political things. It's, um, it's some of the hardest work I think you will ever do because no one ever is the villain in their own story. Everyone thinks that they are right in their mind. So when they're, have, they're playing this whatever game it be, they think they're justified in this. And that's the incredibly difficult part. And I like to say, you don't have to get someone to agree with your position, but you have to get them to, their behavior to change. You don't even have to agree that they need to change their behavior, but you need to change the behavior. That's how you remove the politics. Um, or you can remove the person if it's that drastic. Um, but if it's the, the, the challenge is gonna be if the person responsible for the politics is higher or highest on the chain, then that is going to be incredibly difficult. So one of the things I noticed uh, that you didn't mention is dealing with one of the things I noticed uh, that you didn't mention is dealing with failure. Uh, dealing with failure. Uh, so if you have an individual contributor that gets into a management role and that doesn't work out, how do you make it safe for them to go back to their previous role and vice versa? So incredibly relevant to GitHub question as well. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so I, I'm, in, I'm in a different position. I was brought in from the outside. Um, I was brought in to do a job, play a role, all that sort of stuff. Um, I like to tell engineers that moving to management is a career change. Not a role change or a job change, but a career change. Uh, and you, I think you, the conversation for the first time move has to be explicit. Here's how we're going to have this go down. Here's the conversations we're gonna have. Here's how we're gonna view this. However, we're gonna have a touch point in three or six months. We're gonna see how it's going. And if it's not, we're gonna put you right back. We're gonna go back in a safe way. We're gonna find a way to make it so you don't take an ego hit or your brand or whatever. I don't know what the word is for folks these days internal organizations, but it doesn't take a hit. And some people don't wanna take that chance and that's fine too. Um, but you do have to make it safe for them. And I think that you have to do it via explicitness in that. Um, and understanding too that you will see that a lot for first time managers as well, particularly engineers jumping to first time managers. Um, and if that's not set up from the beginning, uh, work. You have, you have to go work again to have individual conversations with people who aren't working out and say, this doesn't look like it's working out. We would like to find a way to get you back to doing what you're really, really good at, what you seem to be passionate about. In your career, when, uh, when was the time you kind of discovered being the first time, being the first time manager or the second time manager that you now you know better than your manager? So either he has to go or how it has to pass. But what did you do to do that? Was it like all of those things you mentioned not to do? What's a good way, ethical way of going about? It? Going about about surpassing your manager. Now you know you know better than him. <laughs> because you have um, some time. I think we all think we're smarter than our boss. <laughs> I think that's just a universal human trait. Um, I, I, I first became a manager really, really young. Um, I was 21. Um, oh, by the way, I should mention, uh, what was the company you worked at? Sil Silicon Graphics, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a similar story. Uh, I worked at Enron. Um, so that's a fun <laughs> story. So I became a manager at 21 inside of Enron. So I've seen some stuff. <laughs> um, and um, what I learned most in those early years was many, many of the things not to do. And what you know, what you take from not to do is what you don't want to be. But it wasn't until I saw someone who I wanted to be like when I really made this, the commitment and switch and realized, oh, hang on a second, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna go full in on this and be like that person and have that person. And that person did the thing that I think we all need to do at one point in our career or many times in our career, which is take that person in and meet them as a human and talk to them and actually take them under your wing and mentor them actively, not passively. And once that person who ran Bond Europe, SAP here, he was a Kleiner Perkins uh, stable CEO, 
takes you out to dinner, wants to meet your wife, ask about your kids, where you grew up, all that sort of stuff, it kind of changes how you think about this whole thing. It's not about the bits and bites anymore, it's about the people. And I, that's when I started to realize that I, I could probably be good at this if I looked like that guy. So um, I don't think I'm ever going to be better than that person. He was, that person was astounding. Um, but I want to be what he was, and that's what I think. I never, never view myself as having achieved a thing. I always view myself as being aspirationally like something, so it always, I'm always trying to drive towards that. Um, so uh, one last question. Or no last questions. Or no. I think probably one answer. I mean, the gentleman over here, he, uh, he was kind of asking the question, although you did summarize, but just want to add a bit more to that. It was regarding if, you, if, if the person is already kind of, he wants to change the career, as you mentioned, from an engineer to a manager, and then if he doesn't perform well, then how do you have him go back? Maybe have him do his job and the management within the same role and title so he doesn't get dejected well, when you have to go back. So there's the, one of the ways that you can fake management is tech lead. Um, and that's a soft transition and it's, it's dipping your toes in. Um, and tech lead is a real role and I love the role, but it's a way for someone to say, hey, start taking some more responsibility. Do some of those conversations. Talk about leading the architecture or things like this. Um, and a lot of times you'll see people saying, like, I love talking about tech, but I hate the one-on-ones, I hate that conversation, that was too tough. I'm like, okay, tech leads for you, management's not. Because that, that ratio is going to be completely inverted. And um, I use that a lot because uh, when people say they want to go management, I usually say, let's go for a walk. And let's talk about all the things that you're going to hate to do, that we all do on a daily basis. Let's also talk about what you have, why you think that's a, uh, why management's for you. And one of the things that you might hear is why I want to be a manager is I want to be paid more, or I want more responsibility, or I want more, I want more ownership, or I want to tell people what to do. If you ask that question, you're going to get a lot of interesting answers. Um, and some of them will say, management might be for you. Let's go that route. Some of them say, nope, management's not for you, or at least not for you here. Um, so again, meet that person, talk about that, find a safe way for them to go, fail early. If they don't like it, get them back to doing what they want to do. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right.